Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Happy Friday. Welcome to Food Safety Fridays edition 111. Uh, I'm delighted to say we've got uh, George Howlett, CEO of Safety 360, uh, joining us uh, in a little while. And the topic is establishing specific criteria for supplier and product risk assessment. So looking forward to that. Uh, just to say, um, yeah, George is from Safety 360 and Safety 360 uh, one of our kind sponsors of the Food Safety Fridays uh, webinar program that helped to bring these short bursts of education to you uh, regularly. So Safe Food 360, Trace Analytics, Metro Toledo, DMVGL, Business Assurance and AIB International. Thank you to those kind organisations. We couldn't do it without you. Um, Yes, you're already engaging. Type in the chat bar, send us your messages, say hello, tell us where you're from. Um, it is being recorded today. If you miss some, uh, if you get called away, don't worry. Uh, we'll send you a package afterwards by email with the uh, webinar recording, the slides, and the certificate of attendance. Um, okay, that's it for now. I think, uh, are you there? If you're there, George, can you just switch your webcam on? Hi, George. How are you doing? How are you? Great. Uh, where are you calling from today, George? The uh, Dublin. Uh, Dublin as usual, yeah. Dublin and uh, Ireland. Yeah. What's the weather like? Is it snowing at all? Because we've got uh, snow over here uh, today in the UK. No snow here. Uh, just the usual uh, downpour of uh, drizzle, rain. <laughs> Very nice. Okay, George. Uh, I'll just tell the audience about next week while you get your slides ready. Um, no Food Safety Fridays next week, uh, but on Tuesday, um, 9 a.m. to 12 EST, uh, three hour training course, or 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. UK time. That's with Dr. David Rosenblatt, and the subject is managing behavior. Uh, sorry, yeah, managing behavior by maintaining food safety culture. Uh, David's a very engaging presenter. Um, and she will have a great session. Uh, so click the find out more button. Hopefully some of you will join us. Um, for now, I will hand you over to George. Uh, I'll just get the presentation up. Oops, sorry, I think we both did it at the same time. Then. Um, there we go. Presentation there. I'll be back for the Q&A uh, afterwards. Uh, for now, enjoy the presentation. I'll hand you over to George. Okay, so Simon, that's on. Is that uh, the presentation is visible now? Is it? Yes, it's on. Yeah, George. Perfect. Okay. Okay. So, hello, everybody, and uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, today's topic, I think, is is interesting, and it's quite a current topic um, for a lot of food businesses at the moment. Uh, this whole area of how to conduct risk assessment on your suppliers and in materials, ingredients, and so on. Um, it's probably the one aspect of food safety management which has um, received the most attention in recent years. So it's it's well worth uh, spending a little time looking at uh, what's going on um, in general, what the trends are, and how a food business may be able to approach this. What can be a very, very, very complex area and becoming increasingly more complex. So uh, let's crack on then and uh, just to... Before we do, just to let everybody know that on the Safety 360 website, uh, if you go to that site, navigate and uh, find resources, uh, you'll find a whole host of white papers, presentations and tools, uh, much of which is um, relating to the subject matter today, which is the assessment, uh, risk assessment of supply, your supply chain. So check it out, it's all free uh, and um, hope you find some of it of, of value. Okay, so today's topic, uh, how to build a risk and compliance model of, oh, beg your pardon guys, that's the incorrect one. So it's how to do a risk assessment on your food supply chain. A risk assessment, as we know, um, can vary from anything from a simple little you know, general assessment of risk, high, medium or low, right up to complex models where multiple criteria are used to determine what's going on in terms of hazards and risk. And we're gonna cover all of that now over the, the next few slides. On the screen is probably the most simplest rep representation of what a food supply chain 
could look like, albeit you'll be hard pressed to find a supply chain this simple and clean to look at. But it's a good place to start. Uh, so obviously we have the raw materials, um, feeding the supplier that supply to the manufacturing business. You have a distributor and then you have a supplier um, at the end of it as well. So it can be quite simple, nothing, nothing too crazy about that. But when we come to looking at risk in and of itself uh, in the supply chain, it does really exist at two particular levels. And both levels need to be, to be assessed and taken account of in order to build the full picture um, of risk. So those two levels, uh, we'll take a, just a very brief look at them now. The first is the risk associated with your suppliers uh, and other supply chain entities uh, that you may be dealing with. So naturally what we're talking about here are the manufacturers, we're talking potentially about agents, brokers, or indeed, we could be talking about a, a parent supplier representing maybe one, two, or more manufacturing facilities. So already we can see a slight bit of complexity coming into the picture here in terms of supply chain and how you kind of maintain visibility over that. The second element then is the risk associated with the materials and the ingredients which these supply chain entities provide. And that very often is looking at what we call the intrinsic hazards, and we'll explain what that means uh, in a few moments. But the bottom line is, is that uh, companies need to take these two particular elements into account when trying to determine the risk taken supply from a particular supplier. Sounds quite easy, but can be a lot more complex than that. The evolution of the uh, food supply chain, and I don't really need to labor too much on this for most people, but um, you know, the industry over recent decades has gone from what would be a very kind of a local supply chain, where you know guys producing locally, supplying locally, distributing locally, uh, selling locally. And in those scenarios, it's quite easy to keep track of what's happening, where the product is coming from. And if there's an issue, to kind of trace back and see where that's at. But today's supply chain is really, you know, defined by multiple layers or multiple tiers in the supply chain. So while you may be dealing, of course, with the supplier entity one tier down or one tier back, behind that tier could be a very complex web of um, other supplier supply chain entities. And that is really where the challenge lies. And so, I mean, even going back to a few decades ago when we had the BSC crisis, uh, the, the Belgian dioxin uh, crisis as well, uh, one of what characterized those particular uh, issues, uh, certainly in Europe, was the inability of the, the local food business and indeed the local the nation state to actually figure out where the, where the product came from and where it went to. It exposed huge weaknesses in supply chain traceability, which led to a whole raft of new legislation being introduced. But that complexity has only increased, and um, uh, the recent, more recent issue of um, horse gates, so the presence of horse meat in uh, meat products where it shouldn't have been legally, um, again, still highlighted some difficulties that do exist, at least in the European food supply chain. So the supply chain is now global, well and truly, uh, except for small artisan producers or lo very, very local uh, family-run food businesses. Uh, most food businesses have a complex multinational global supply chain uh, upon which they're based. And the lack of understanding of what's going on in that supply chain is in and of itself a risk as well. Okay. So what's on the screen there now, guys, would be a more typical representation of what the supply chain looks like for most companies. Um, it does really resemble a kind of a complex web and connections and relationships that exist, uh, not just between business entities, but they could be, you know, cross-border, um, could be cross-continental in many cases. So we can see on the left-hand side there, we could have a whole number of manufacturing facilities um, producing ingredients or some sort of raw material. 
feeding into another local facility that might process it and then supply it into your, to suppliers, agents, distributors, brokers, and then in turn, the material or the ingredient should arrive at you. And you in this case simply means the, the, the purchasing manufacturing facility. So to understand and to assess risk in this kind of complex uh, supply chain really is a challenge. And I think for a lot of food companies these days, the, the, their supply chain visibility is characterized more by the gaps in it, certainly the gaps in their knowledge about it, than what it is that they're actually clear about and what they know. Um, doesn't necessarily mean that companies are not doing what they're supposed to be doing, but the practical realities of actually you know, have an intelligence, sufficient intelligence about your supply chain requires a huge amount of resources, some kind of organized system, including a risk assessment model when that data does in fact arrive. But what also char characterizes the, uh, the modern supp supply chain is uh, for each layer or each tier or each level that the material goes through, you see the addition of risk at each of those elements. So from the facilities moving to the supplier, to being handled by agents and brokers, coming to the, uh, the manufacturing company utilizing the materials, who then in turn feed it into another supply chain for distributors, brokers, and agents, onto say, exam for example, retailers. At each level, a certain amount of risk is added. Now it can be very difficult to quantify that. Uh, very often, it has to be qualitative assessment by its very nature. But the fundamental point of this slide is really to highlight the fact that the more complex your supply chain, potentially the greater the risk. Nothing wrong with that in and of itself, as long as you understand what that risk is and be able to measure it at least to an acceptable level. So you know, measurement and monitoring of that risk is important. <clears throat> Let's just spend a little time looking at the specific requirements around supplier and supply chain risk assessment. And we'll take a, uh, a look at the GFSI requirements and, and then we'll take a quick look at the uh, Food Safety Modernization Act and the particular rules that have arisen out of that, that legislation. Because it does give us a very good sense uh, of understanding of what is required for the modern day food business. I'll say at the outset that uh, the requirements aren't straightforward. Uh, and they have evolved recently to become more complex. So going back even maybe three or four years ago, uh, it would be sufficient for you just to do kind of a generalized risk assessment of your suppliers. You know, maybe you might collect an audit certificate. Uh, you might even go to the trouble of doing an audit of the supplier as well. And that pretty much would have done the job, at least for B or C and other GFSI standards, you would get your certificates and then you get on with the daily business. But it has changed quite dramatically where a lot of these global food standards and certainly under FISMA, the requirement has shifted not beyond just the supplier, but also to an individual assessment of risk for, in, for each and every raw material, ingredient, packaging item that you purchase. <clears throat> now, while that's just sim a simple addition of a few words in the requirements, the real impact, the practical impacts on food businesses has been significant because many companies could be utilizing in the region of you know, maybe tens, hundreds, in some cases thousands of raw materials. And to conduct an individual risk assessment on all of them with you know, a qualified and a trained individual, somebody who understands the nature of risk and food safety, that costs money, it costs time, it costs resources. And um, it's not an insignificant investment that needs to be made to do that. So a lot of companies at the moment are making that adjustment. They're uh, trying to figure out what's the best approach. So the initial requirement is simply to do it. But as time goes by, companies will also then move on to the, the level of, well, how can we do it more efficiently? And that does require some clarity around your risk assessment models, which we're going to talk about in a moment. But the scope for the BRC uh, is that you must risk assess your suppliers and indeed you must risk assess individual materials and ingredients. And you must take account of things like allergens, foreign body risks, microchemical. Um, and this list is only going to increase. So you have to absolutely be certain of that fact. 
in addition to those materials, the uh, BRC says you must also assess the supplier, and risk assessment is the basis of doing that. Not just initially, but on an almost continuous basis now, uh, the performance of the supplier needs to be reviewed. And again, guys, you can see it there based on risk and defined performance criteria. So this is effectively now a full-time function for many companies, is this whole area of risk assessment, risk management, performance um, um, of your supply chain entities. And I'm sure many people, when we do come to the Q&A, will have stories on how they're trying to cope with this and how to deal with this. And, uh, but I think at this university accepted it, 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 it's, it's, it's a, an additional burden. Now, the SQF Standard Edition 8, uh, so the code uh, also has requirements around the area of supplier assessment. Um, standard effectively says, in general, that you must risk assess raw materials, packaging and materials. So, um, again, the focus seems to be more and more now on the intrinsic risks present in the materials you're purchasing. Not in general, not by category, but by the actual product that you are buying and bringing in the door of your facility. So it says you have, must have specifications agreed. They can be very useful. Uh, clearly define what you are purchasing, and not just in terms of the actual attributes of the material that you need to make your own products, but in areas such as microbiological hazards, chemical hazards, allergens, um, and physical uh, hazards. It does say you should use a rating system to uh, conduct this risk assessment and from this you must develop appropriate control so obviously if there is a risk associated with a material that you've assessed and identified then you should put in place some controls and probably ideally then measure the mitigation effect of those controls okay. also it goes on to say that you must have uh, methods of approving suppliers so again what we can see now emerging in the requirements is Taken the traditional assessment of supplier risk, that's what kind of you know what certification they may have, what systems of control they may have, management procedures, and integrating into that at some level the risk of the material to come up with a more holistic and complete picture of the risks associated. Okay. 2.4.4 4 uh, also goes on a little bit to talk about audits, and it says that audits should be based uh, on risk. So this is actually a good practice because if you are a company engaged in auditing your own suppliers, if that's a heavy activity that you're conducting, very costly, uh, it is nice that it, you know if you can do good quality risk assessment and reduce the amount of audits that you need to conduct. That can save time and there can be some payback there. But again, it does you do need to work on the uh, basis that your risk assessment models are strong enough, reliable enough to give you some good reliable outputs uh, for informing that decision making. Certainly what you don't want to do is make those decisions based on poor quality risk data. Now, a very quick look at the FSSC 22000. Uh, this, <clears throat> excuse me, of course, does uh, include the requirements of ISO 22K and the technical standard for uh, prerequisite programs. So, um, this standard doesn't really uh, offer up too much more than what we've already seen in the other uh, requirements. Um, it again says you should assess your suppliers and the ability to uh, deliver good, uh, safe and um, legal food as well, uh, products to you. So now we move on to the Food Safety Modernization Act. And uh, guys, any attempt by me to cover off all the requirements for uh, supplier verification programs uh, uh, will be a complete act of folly at this stage because, I mean, this, there's enough here to keep keep uh, the IFS QN going with webinars all year round, so uh, I won't attempt to do that. Uh, suffice to say, though, that uh, it was really FISMED that you know, up the ante in terms of su uh, supply chain risk assessment. So you had the uh, situation where the, the GFSI standards did have quite a requirement in place, but then FISMED came along and said, listen, guys, if you're in the business of producing food, 
exporting or importing it in the US market, you need to have in place supplier uh, assessment, but in addition, you must also have individual material risk assessments. So that was basically it. So once, once that happened, uh, the, GFS, the GFSI standards needed obviously to react because their fundamental requirement of those standards is you must be meeting the requirements of the local legislation, in this case, the United States. So what does it say? Well, at a very high level, it says that you, you must conduct a risk assessment and you must identify hazards which require some sort of uh, control in the supply chain. So you need to conduct audits or you know some sort of assessments. You may need to do product testing. Um, you may need to collect specific data about the validity of um, preventive control measures. Um, and all this really uh, adds up to a lot of work and a lot of paperwork um, which needs to be organized, filed, you know, and then repeated. Um, so that's the nature really of FISMA. Uh, it, it is at this stage probably setting the bar for what needs to be done in terms of um, managing out the supply chain. It's in terms of people's uh, practical experience on the ground, uh, again, it is an emerging picture to see really, really and truly how the FDA will enforce a lot of this uh, into the future. But uh, you know, in the meantime, companies need to do this work. Just on the final slide on FISMA there, there's a point to provide assurance that a hazard requiring a supply chain control has been significantly minimized or prevented. So to meet that legal requirement, that's virtually impossible to do that without the, the application of risk assessment. You just you couldn't really do that without using proper risk assessment tools. So that's, that's, uh, that's an interesting point. And uh, then the application of those controls uh, obviously need to be put in place. Uh, not necessarily by company, it could be at some other uh, level in the supply chain. Nonetheless, it doesn't preclude the fact that you must have some sort of documented evidence that that control is in place, or certainly that will be um, uh, enforced at some point in the future. Okay, so that's just setting the scene. Uh, we can see that there is quite a significant uh, legal and uh, indeed commercial framework uh, demanding that companies do this, um, the question is, well, how, you know, what's, what's the best approach for doing it? What does good look like for a food business in terms of meeting legal requirements, but also having an internal approach which is workable and you know, is, is good for the company too. So let's talk about risk assessment models in general. Okay, and here's a, here's a concise slide which summarizes probably the two main models that are used in risk assessment in the food industry. <clears throat> and the first of those is the matrix model. Uh, I think most of us will be familiar with it. it this is the, uh, you know, the matrix, the, uh, the grid, where if you're running across the top, you'll have your severity of impact, and running vertically down will be the, the probability or the likelihood that it will happen. So what does that mean? It means that you may have a hazard. The hazard could be, for example, salmonella in a, a high-risk meat product. The questions you would ask in the matrix model is, well, uh, what's the likelihood that this hazard will arise in the food product at the point of consumption, usually? Um, and that can be expressed as a high, medium, or low, or critical, or major, or whatever. It, it, it's really up to the company to decide that. So how often, or what's the frequency at which this hazard is present in the food, or how likely is it to be present? And once you understand that bit of information, you go on to ask the initial question is, well, if it is present in the event that it is present, what is the likely impact on the consumer? Which can range from anything from a mild illness, tummy bug, up to and including death. So um, you're trying to get your hands on a measure of two, two very clear and distinct um, you know, attributes of risk. And then you can multiply them together and that gives an overall rating of risk. And so this is widely used. We all, I mean, I think we're all very used to this and familiar with it, particularly with HACCP and uh, in terms of preventative control plans. Works very well. Uh, absolutely nothing wrong with it. It's very useful, easy to apply, easy to understand. 
Now, the other model, uh, which we'll take a look at now shortly, is what's called, or what, certainly what we call, is the criteria model. And it's uh, slightly different from the matrix uh, model. Uh, so the matrix model, you you are just measuring two kind of uh, kind of attributes about the risk of a specific hazard. So matrix model works very well when you have one identified hazard, like salmonella, one process step, let's say cooking or thermal treat, uh, heat treatment. Um, and in that case, you can easy, relatively easily measure the likelihood of occurrence or survival, in this case of the, if the pathogen, and then severity of impact, which is usually quite well documented. So that's easy and that works very well and, and, and long may that uh, continue when it comes to specific hazards for a specific product and a specific process step. However, that approach begins to break down a little bit when you try to uh, apply it to, um, say, supplier risk assessment or indeed the, um, the risk assessment of a particular material. So because, for example, a particular material may come, may arrive at your factory premises with not just one hazard, but maybe two or more multiple hazards which have been identified. And in this case, the risk assessment model doesn't quite lend itself very, very well in the matrix form. So uh, you may also need to take into account other factors, just beyond the intrinsic uh, risk as well. So certainly with supplier assessment, you're assessing a supplier facility. Um, you need to take account of a lot of other variables that, that may exist, pull them all together and try and come up with some measure of risk. So, um, so it's clear for most companies that the matrix model just simply doesn't work in that scenario. Uh, you can go through all the trouble of doing it, but it's going to give you back some um, fairly poor usable data upon which you will make decisions and certainly would not recommend it. Okay. Okay, so there's the matrix model, guys, just uh, graphically represented. Probability multiplied by severity equals risk. Uh, you can apply uh, numerical values to these, but in essence, it is qualitative risk assessment. Don't be fooled by the fact that you're using numbers. At best, it's semi-quantitative, and that's okay. And that's perfectly fine uh, for the intended purpose uh, for most food businesses. The matrix model for food businesses though, also allows you to take into account other variable factors uh, beyond um, probability and severity of impact. So some of the common things which uh, people are you know, you know, kind of looking towards in terms of risk assessment of supply chain are things like certification. Okay, so you know, has, has, is the supplier already indeed the material been certified at some level under some scheme? whether it be GFSI scheme or a commodity scheme or um, some other kind of you know, vertical sectoral scheme or, that could be used. Um, intrinsic hazards, so what also we're seeing an increasing trend towards uh, identifying the intrinsic hazards within a particular material or uh, ingredient. So for example, if you're buying in raw meat, uh, for further processing, there is an intrinsic hazard in that, and that is pathogenic bacteria. So no matter how well the practices are in the slaughtering, cutting, boning uh, facilities, there will always be some level of risk in terms of pathogen contamination. So it is intrinsic to at least the process under which they're produced, and certain other materials may intrinsically contain sort of you know uh, toxins, for example, which may need to be dealt with. Uh, through some further processing. Things such as vulnerability, uh, the likelihood of exposure, of you know, intentional um, interference with the supply chain for malicious or for other, for other motivations. Country of origin is another thing which a lot of uh, companies are using more and more. So the country of origin actually, just even by its, its, its nature, can tell you a lot about the, uh, the risk that may come with a particular supplier and a particular uh, ingredient. Uh, we'll talk about that actually because we want to use that as an example later on. Uh, exposure then, um, um, expo so exposure is a it's a description. So if contamination does occur, um, what's the like the likely exposure of that in the general population, for example? So if you're if you have two facilities producing the exact same product, let's say uh, cooked ham meats, 
Uh, but one facility is producing 100 tons of the products, uh, say, in a week, while the other facility is producing 10 tons a week. Uh, they both have a food safety issue, which is, let's say, E. coli 0157 contamination. The impact of the facility producing the larger volume will obviously be greater, and that's the exposure assessment. So the exposure and the risk is greater. And the concept is quite useful because uh, regulatory agencies can use it as a basis of doing their own assessment uh, audits or audit programs. They may focus on that facility producing the larger volume in terms of inspections uh, as compared to the facility with the, uh, the, the lesser volume as well. So these are kind of trends. This is kind of getting more sophisticated uh, in terms of how people do the risk assessments. Um, of course, underlying all of this is the absolute necessity of collecting good quality, reliable data where it's available. And it's not always, it's not always available. Let's take a closer look now at the criteria-based risk assessment models because this is emerging really more and more as the as the, the method of choice food business assessing the suppliers and indeed the materials. So let me just explain a little bit about this criteria model. Uh, in the criteria model, you are you're really trying to integrate and trying to understand and integrate the the, diff the risks that come with different aspects of take and supply. So, for example, you may have a number of criteria, such as um, you know the country of origin, for example, could be one criteria. Another it could be the number of food safety recalls which this particular facility has experienced over the last 24 months, for example. You may want to take account of uh, the handling of allergens in the facility, which are declared or otherwise, and and then and so on. There's many other criteria, and we'll take a look at those in a moment. But again, underlying the uh, the model of criteria assessment is the is the fact that not all um, risks are equal. So certain criteria may have a greater impact on risk than other criteria. So in addition to handling multiple criteria, you're also looking at the the quantitative effect of, of each of those criteria as well, and that can be typically called risk rating. So in the uh, graphic that you can see above there, we have four criteria, and criteria three uh, occupies a, a, a greater space on the uh, slide. And what that's, that's telling us is that the risk associated with this particular criteria is more significant or has greater exposure in terms of in, re in relation to criteria one, two, and four. But when you put them all together, you add those risks together in this case, you get the sum total of your risk as you've measured it. Okay, so that's the basic concept of uh, the criteria model. So that's all well and good, but the next step is you need to move on and actually decide what criteria you should be using. And there is no, uh, there's no uh, one, one uh, answer fits all, unfortunately, for this, because it really does depend on uh, the nature of the product you're producing, um, the volume you're purchasing, and many, many other things. Uh, it can change for particular kind of suppliers, and we'll take a look at some some uh, more focused criteria for different types of suppliers. But in general, you can look at the following types of things. And uh, in safe food, working with our clients, we're seeing more and more of these criteria being used. And uh, indeed, we would advise a lot on this kind of stuff. And but let's let's take it from the top pretty quickly, which is GFSI. So that be a really handy place to start. If there are, has already been a third party assessment of the supplier by, um, and they've issued a certificate against a particular standard, that does provide you with uh, quite high quality data around which you can make some decisions. By no means guarantees that what they're supplying is safe, but it can give you a reasonable level of comfort from which you can then start additional assessment of risk. So that typically is a standard element of, um, of a, risk, a criteria based risk assessment model. Uh, facility from country with high risk rating, so that can be quite useful. Uh, looking up some data, which can tell you what you know what's the typical kind of risk associated with goods and materials uh, are coming out of this particular country or market. You can add that to your GFSI certification. History of food fraud. So again, if there is a history of uh, some issues within this this from the supplier, 
uh, it may increase your uh, rating of risk around them. So there may be some issues there. That they could indeed have been resolved or they may not. Uh, but that is quite a useful one to give you an indicator at least. Uh, to answer that question in terms of criteria, you need data. You can obviously, obviously can't, um, you know, uh, guess that one. But if there is the data available, either directly from a declaration from that supplier or there's some uh, publicly available data, that's good. You can then start incorporating that into the buckets of uh, risk assessment, if you like. So you know, the level can increase slightly or not at all. Volume of purchased materials. Okay, so this is relating back to what we were talking about as exposure in uh, previous slides. Um, same applies if you're purchasing. So if you're purchasing, uh, let's, I'm going to just say, uh, just for simplicity's sake, guys, let your, you're buying in sugar. And you're buying in sugar from three different suppliers, but one of them provides you with 90% of your sugar uh, requirements in terms of your process and recipe. Then that supplier is by definition higher risk because if something goes wrong on that supplier, the impacts are much greater. The, the volume of recall back from the market, the potential of uh, adverse health effects on your consumers, more will be more will be exposed and infected. Um, and when you relate relate that to the smallest supplier of sugar to you, same events will have a less in, uh, have a lesser impact. So again, it would be a good idea to actually get some measure on the volume of purchased materials. You can do that by tonnage or you can do it by some other um, metric, whichever best works, works for you. Uh, allergen controls, that's uh, obviously a very important one. Allergens uh, account for a significant uh, number of recalls these days. Food defense plan, obviously that comes in relation to um, you know, ex exposure of the supply chain. Um, recall and alerts in the last 24 months, very useful data. If this company has experienced one or more recalls over the last 24 months, you may want to account for that. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that the supplier is a bad supplier because their recalls are, you know, they were part of, uh, you know, making food these days. Um, but if there's a consistent number and it's it's quite recent, it may well just trigger um, a little bit of concern around the ability of the supplier to produce good products. Add that to your risk assessment again, to whatever extent you need. Certificates of analysis and certificates of conformance. So. Uh, if the company is in the, uh, the habit of uh, issuing certificates, which give you some uh, concrete, objective data about the status, the safety of the product, then that also um, can mitigate the risk. If, so if you don't do it, you may well want to increase the risk rating because you won't really know from batch to batch what's going on. Now, you may not want to know, and it may be unnecessary, but uh, it can be used. So there, there are some generic uh, requirements, guys, that can go in. I'm not saying that they, these are the ones you should use, but they are a good uh, initial um, indicator of what, what can be applied. <clears throat> and you may well have your, other, uh, your own um, risk um, requirements as well. Let's take a look at a meat company supplier. So again, you can use a lot of the same things. Uh, you may want to look at additional issues such as species. So the issue of species contamination, you know, horse meat getting into, uh, uh, beef products or and so on. Allergens um, can also be a good one. Um, integration of the supply chain from which you're taking. So if, if, if the supplier is, is more integrated in terms of how it operates its own slaughtering facilities, chilled uh, coal stores, etc., uh, you may decide that that's a, that's a less risky operation than it going from one country to the next to the next for all the different stages of processing. Let's take a look at ingredient suppliers. Uh, so again, a lot of the usual uh, suspects are there. You may you know, want to add some additional ones in. Uh, intrinsic risk is important. So the intrinsic nature of the ingredients, it's well worth your while spending time doing a little bit of research around that. What, you know, it could be, you know, what is it about the product? It's pH, it's acidity, uh, it's water content. All these things can contribute um, or can add to or mitigate the risk of that product. So that's, that's um, that could be introduced in that case. Packaging suppliers, uh, again, so probably less complex, uh, depending on whether it's primary, secondary, uh, primary contact packaging. Uh, are they accredited to a specific packaging global standard, like the BRC packaging standard 
for example. So um, generally speaking, you don't really need to do as much for packaging. Uh, maybe for primary contact, you will need to collect certificates, migration testing certs, for example. Um, that type of stuff, uh, you know, the assessment criteria can be tailored around that as well. So conducting criteria-based risk assessment. So how do you apply this practically? Well, it, you know, this is actually it's quite straightforward. So once you identify that cr criteria, which uh, you're happy to roll with, um, you can simply then you know, pop it into a grid, as on the screen there, and um, apply a risk rating to them. So in this particular example, you can see that the, the risk rating assigned to each criteria varies. So you might say, for example, at 10 risk points for a company that doesn't have a BRC certificate, for example. You might give them zero risk points. In other words, it's, it's, it's neutral. If they do have a BRC certificate that they can offer you, it can be quite good. So also maybe if you know, take the criteria of uh, number of recalls in the last 12 months, if they've had one, zero, or zero uh, recalls, you can give them a risk rating of zero. If they've had one, you may add on five risk points. Uh, if they have two, you may add on 15. And if they have three or more, you may add on 50 or plus, which is effectively kind of a, like a knockout criteria. You will just simply, at that stage, you really just don't want to do business with these people unless you have to. And uh, you just knock them out of the system. Now, all these figures are arbitrary, guys. They're not, um, they're not, you know, they're not absolute, they're all relative uh, figures. And the key to building this particular table is to, to weight, to get the relative weights of each uh, criteria correct, okay? And that really comes down to uh, very much judgment, uh, experience of, you know, good, good qualified and experienced assessors, you know, uh, figuring that out. Now, it's absolutely fine if you uh, just assign them all the same level of risk too. Um, and then on the other end of the, of the uh, spectrum, you see a lot of companies just identifying key criteria which are knockouts. So if there's any movement on those criteria, it's an absolute no. We move on and find another supplier to, to work with. So you can see, guys, it's a simple table. It's a simple grid. Uh, you, know, you can create this in Excel, and you can just you know, click, drop down, and it will total up your uh, risk rating score at the end. Uh, that gives you a figure, like let's say 105 you know, uh, risk points. And then you need to answer the question, well, what does that mean? What does it mean if, they, if the guys get, if the supplier gets 50 as compared to 100 as compared to 150? Okay, because as I said, because these are really just, they don't, they're not an absolute measure of anything except just the, the relative impact of the criteria themselves. So let's take a look at what, what we can do with those output figures. So again, you can have another uh, simple model. Uh, so you can, you know, uh, create bands of risk or ranges of risk. So if the risk rating figure comes out between one and 35, we'll say that's low, it's not significant, and we don't need to worry about it too much. If it comes out at medium, well then, yeah, that could be significant, uh, between 35 and 65, and then high between 66 and 105. But you get the point, guys, here, it's really, you're trying to figure out um, the range with, which, within which the uh, risk value falls, and the point about this is that if it is significant, uh, in this case, medium or high, that's telling you you need to mitigate the risk in some, in some way. And that could be you know, to more product testing. It could be to introduce uh, a lethal kill step in the process if they're not already in place. It could be to reject the supplier for approval. Uh, again, you just need to figure all that out in the context of your own, your own appetite for risk and the policies of your company. But it is, um, although the criteria model is slightly more complex, you can see it is quite easy to set up and manage with, um, with assuming that you put in some, some thought into it in the initial stages. Okay, so here's an example of how you might you know, apply this for a particular criteria. In this example, we're taking the risk country or the origin of, of material. Is it from what could be deemed a risk country or a high risk country? So uh, the basis of the risk in this case is that um, it, it, it's based on kind of an assumption, uh, probably more than that, that if materials are coming from what's deemed to be a high-risk country, then the risk of issues are happening are higher compared to 
a low risk country. I mean, and when we talk about risk, we're talking about you know local political, social, cultural, economic impacts, study my impact on fraud, uh, corruption, and and things of that nature. Okay, so does I mean it's, this is a very simple example. Uh, does the material or the supplier come from a country considered to be high risk? The answer in that case is yes or no. Uh, if you assign no, you get zero risk points. And if you select yes, in this example, you get 20 risk points. So you've added to the risk, okay? And you can obviously, or we, ideally you should be referring to some objective data, some reliable data that you, you can say yes or no in this particular case. So for example, uh, you could um, refer to risk country classification data. So governance indicators from the World Bank, for example, will give you a list of all those countries, the risk associated with it, and then you can use um, the determination of it's a high risk or low risk country. So for example, that can be downloaded from this World um, Governance Indicators website, and you can actually attach a report. Okay, so you can produce a, a table or a grid of this nature, which will give you all the metrics and the determination of risk of that country. So this is a really, really nice, but simple example of how you do risk assessment based on criteria. You've set a criteria, which is risk country classification. You have some objective data, which supports the answer to yes or no. And you can attach that or keep that with your risk assessment document as um, supporting uh, evidence of how the risk is done. Okay, so... Uh, Simon, that's me. Uh, that is quite a, quite a fast overview of what can, what can be a complex area, but I just really wanted to give people a good idea of where they might start and how they might build uh, a risk assessment. Uh, thanks, George. You can switch your webcam on. Um, we'll go through the questions. Um, there have been lots of uh, comments throughout. I don't know if you noticed this, George, but yeah. No, I don't, I don't think yeah. Okay. Um, questions for George um, while we have him with us. Um, yes, Tina, we will be sharing the slides afterwards. We'll send an email to our registrants with the recording slides, etc. So Lamprost is saying his question on country risk classification was thoroughly answered. Um, anybody got a question? There's that many comments that uh, there was answering each other's questions throughout. Anybody got a question for George? Yes, I've just said that Cindy is being recorded. Um, right, okay. What, um, what database, or do you know of any databases, George? Uh, Margaret's asking the database you suggest to verify risk. Um, well, look, I mean, it depends on uh, the hazard that's been risk assessed or identified. So, uh, you know, I mean, in the case of the country risk classification, you, there are a few sources, uh, resources there. Some are free, some you pay for. Um, but in terms of other risk and hazards, you're, it's really everything that might be available to you through the internet or through other uh, reference materials. This is a uh, the nature of risk assessment, most of it is about data gathering, data interpretation, and anything goes because uh, you may not be able to find good quality data. But there is no one definitive database that I would say, I would believe you could refer to. Yeah. Okay. Uh, long longiness. How do you carry out a supplier audit for a broker of many food items? Well, uh, so if you're taking supply in from a broker, you'll obviously have a list of the materials or ingredients they're supplying you with. So uh, arguably you would need to risk assess each of those um, individually in terms of intrinsic risk and, um, and maybe beyond that, depending on, on what you, you see. Uh, but, uh, there are now in the GFSI, um, I think standards which can be used for agents and brokers. So. I would suggest that's probably the best place to start. If you look up, look them up, find them, uh, it will give you a good checklist uh, and scope of what should be altered and the controls that are in place. Okay, thanks, yeah, good idea, actually. 
charge. Uh, Scott, medium and high risk, medium and high risk are significant. How do you determine what needs to be done? Okay, well, what you need to do is you uh, you need to go back to the hazard. Uh, so, what is the hazard? What's the nature of the hazard? Um, what is it about the hazards? You know, you know, kind of you need to talk about like hazard characterization. Uh, what is it about this hazard that makes it risky? And that's your starting point. And you would need to research the appropriate control measures, preventive control measures, mitigation measures that could be applied. So that really requires a bit of research. Now, very often the control measures are pretty much standardized. Yeah, well, they're established, you know. So if you're looking at particular pathogens in relation to certain food products, uh, you'll obviously be looking at you know, you know, sterilization or thermal processing. And then you can just research what, what the guidance is on that or what the legal requirements on time temperatures and so on. So it's just it's a bit of research. You just need to go through it in a methodical way. But it all starts with the hazard and the characterization of the hazard itself. And then that gives you sufficient, sufficient information to make some informed decisions about controls. Okay. Uh, Alison, co-packing co responsibilities, what would the responsibilities be for a co-packer? Yeah, I mean, it depends. It depends on what the contractual nature of the, of the relationship is. Uh, some people utilizing co-packers will just simply deal with the co-packer as virtually their own operation, and they may want to do the risk assessment themselves, or they may provide the co-packer with a predefined list of approved suppliers and materials that they can only use for packing their products, for example. Or you could just simply rely upon the co-packer, uh, audit the co-packer's own systems of supplier assessment and material assessment, and um, and make a make a judgment about whether they're good enough for you to rely upon. So, a few options. It really depends on the again appetite for risk. If you're a major global food brand using cold packers, uh, you're going to want to protect that brand maybe a little bit more. Your appetite for risk is less, so you may just want to go back yourself and, and conduct an assessment in the supply chain and not rely on your cold packer. Okay, um, Kevin uh, is asking about the Safe Food 360 solution, uh, how applicable is it for a food box meal company, for example, HelloFresh? I, okay, well, I, I mean, the short answer is I don't know, uh, uh, but we can certainly have a chat at some point and determine your requirements and see uh, if it's of interest, of course. Yeah. Okay, Kevin, just pick up the uh, contact details from, uh, are they on the slides, George? Yeah. Yes, of course. Yeah. yeah. So pick up either the contact details or website and head over to Safety 360, send them a message. Have you heard of Horizon Scan, George? Cindy's put that in the... Yeah. Um, Horizon Scanning, yeah, is it's become a requirement, particularly among a lot of retailers. So uh, again, it's about it's about collecting information and data and making some sort of predictions around emerging hazards and, and, and supply chain. So it's very useful. It's I would definitely say it's it's worth doing. Yeah, and I think Cindy's put horizonscan.com, so maybe there's a website as well that you can visit. Uh, Jake Brinkman, for BRC risk assessments, what do we need to, to look for to assess variety and species contamination? What do we need to look for to assess variety and species of contamination? I'm not really sure what the question is exactly, but I presume it's the, uh, it, it's, it's the risk of other species getting into your product. So, I mean, you would look at your supplier, uh, does the supplier slaughtering facility and, and, other, and subsequent uh, processing facilities handle single species or multi-species? Obviously, if it's multi-species, the risk increases, so you would need to determine uh, the, you know, the, the quality of changeover procedures from species to species and uh, and so on. So that that's uh, pretty much along as a piece of string sort of uh, stuff, but yeah. Okay, and um, how about if you buy some ingredients from grocery stores for such as coffee, cinnamon and peanuts that are used in ice cream production, but Daisy's asking how can I approve them since they don't provide a certificate or a letter of guarantee or anything? You can't really. Um, I mean, I would. I mean, obviously, if you're a small business and you're artisan producer and all that, uh, 
the quantity of ingredients you, you need to purchase will be far less than uh, larger companies. Uh, but you may be using those ingredients at a rate which just you couldn't use you know, over a reasonable length of time, so they go out of date. Cost of it is quite significant. Um, look, I, I would say buying from grocery stores is probably not the best way of doing it. Certainly, if you run into trouble, you're you're going to be cut out from that one for sure. Uh, maybe there's some uh, other food companies nearby uh, who are using similar ingredients who might be prepared to share small quantities of the ingredients with you. Uh, provide you with a copy of the search to go with that as well. Just, it's a uh, just a suggestion, but I would check it out first. Uh, sourcing from grocery stores you, is not not really the best way of going about it. But I understand. Okay, Cara, Caroline uh, Wang. We have got some broker supplier not willing to disclose their manufacturing site. Any recommendations how we then can do a risk assessment? Yep, uh, it's, it's not uncommon. Obviously, the, it's driven by commercial uh, considerations, uh, certainly by the broker. Uh, I think it's extremely difficult if you, um, you, you don't have visibility on that tier uh behind your brokers uh, so i would say it's a diff uh, difficult i was i mean it's probably not the best suggestion in the world is you might have to change your uh agent or broker um, but i think to be honest with you over time and in, in, in the relatively short space and time uh brokers who don't get on board with that uh, you know making data visible and available uh Will um, I think will struggle more and more. Now, what they may well do is provide the information on behalf of those manufacturing agents, but I still think that's probably not ideal. But I think that's going to change. I'd be fairly certain. I mean, there are a few of them who do resist it, and then I think many are coming on board. Okay, uh, Evelyn, um, if because of distance you're unable to physically conduct an on-site audit of your suppliers, will a criteria model risk assessment satisfy BRC's uh, requirements? Hmm. If you're unable to actually audit your own supplier physically, um, you know, I mean, like, I mean, yeah, I mean, that's okay. I mean, it depends, again, it depends on the risk assessment you. The, the necessity to actually audit the facility should arise out of the risk assessment. Yeah, you know, all things being equal, um, um, so that would be kind of almost like a preventative control measure or control measure of some description. Um, so, if they have a BRC certificate, they've had a BRC audit. So you can collect that, review it, and you can make some assumptions about the risk. Um, and you may be happy to roll with that risk. That could be just simply an acceptable risk in your particular system uh, because look you know commercially just look if you were to be flying around the world auditing all your suppliers you would you would probably have little money left in the bank that's particularly if you're a small smaller company um so i'm not sure about the uh, satisfy brc requirements but uh but just just one on the face of it if you have a brc certificate for a supplier get the report review it and then you may decide then to do an audit based on that or the absence of a BRC certificate, more likely. Okay. Um, just just saying, um, is saying, are you there, George? Sir? Yeah. Uh, just saying, is saying, thank you very much. Has your model system been validated by any authority, scientific and or regulatory? That's no, is a short answer. Uh, I don't. I, I, uh, again, I mean, for a risk assessment model in, in the food industry being used anywhere, I doubt there's any validated models out there. Uh, it would require a huge amount of uh, significant uh, work, research, um, and at the end of the day, you would get a little value from it. This is really about you know you establishing what you know to be a reasonable model, you know, of of assessment. Okay, uh, Ruth. How can you be sure you've considered all the relevant risks? You can't. <laughs> um, it's a short answer, but uh, uh, the more research you do, uh, the more likely you are to get to that point. Risk assessment is not uh, perfect, by the way, uh, guys. It's, it's it's characterized more by by the, the gaps and the weaknesses in your models than it is by what you get right. Right. Okay. Uh, Laurie, any, 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 sorry. Sorry. Just a very important point there is uh, 
in your, your risk assessment model, I didn't cover it today, but you should also, not in addition to measuring the risk, you should measure the uncertainty of the assessment. So you can kind of have a, a you know, um, we have a white paper on the website about this. So if you're basing your assessment on a, like for example, a B or C certificate, that's hard objective data. You can get, you can, you can bet the house on that one, yeah. And you can give it a, very, uh, you know, a zero uncertainty rating. But if you're basing it on judgment and uh, poor quality data, you can add on a little bit more onto the risk assessment. So if you risk, risk assess a two, sorry, 20, you may add on an extra five risk points because you're not really comfortable with the data that you're using. Okay, so, that, so that's how you address that. So, yeah. Okay, thanks, George. Uh, Lorian, any tips on shifting to criteria risk assessment when you have used matrix models in the past? Yeah, I, I would just advise you just to take your time, uh, develop, spend, spend time developing your model, identifying your criteria, collecting as much scientific information and data on that criteria that you can use, and then just do, uh, let, you know, as your cycle of risk assessment comes around, use the criteria model when that, when that happens. Um, that, just there's just some general tips I, I would offer. Yeah. Okay, uh, Brian, um, do you think that the matrix risk assessment model is sufficient for both FISMA and GFSI, or is it lacking and needing to be replaced with criteria based? Well, I think if you look at, uh, say, BRC and the FS uh, FISMA, uh, they do pretty much list out, they're quite prescriptive in some ways of the things you must look at. And it really does drive you towards a criteria based model. You know, so I think the requirements of the standards and legislation have made the, the matrix approach less relevant, less, less useful in this particular scenario. Yeah. Um, Alison, a bit of a long one. Uh, basically, she's a co-packer of toll processing, Run, runs a lot of product for customers uh, that we just provide a cleaning service. How much responsibility do we have to analyze risk on the ingredients? Okay, so I'm not, I, I don't entirely understand the question as it relates to cleaning services. Um, maybe Alison might maybe just provide a little bit more information and come back to it. Okay. Um, lady, uh, the question is how, um, how the packaging companies construct supplier approval program if materials received are purchased by customer or rarely we buy materials based on customer instructions they told us who to buy from yep so, i mean uh, yeah again that, that would be typ typical for for coal packers is they would be issued a, a list of be told who to buy from and uh that usually happens for you know kind of we are producing a kind of a branded product for somebody else so the liability of that branded product you know in certain, well certainly in certain markets will lie with your customer uh, I'm not sure there's much you can do about us I mean commercially if you, I mean you wouldn't want to get into the business of risk assessing them you know you avoid that um, mm -hmm. so I think you pretty much have to roll with us I'm not sure there's any real implications I mean, you could go to the trouble of asking your customer, you know, are you basing this list on risk, uh, some sort of detailed risk assessment? Because in that case, you may be bringing in uh, hazards into your operation, uh, which you're unaware of. So if your customer is just simply making up a list of desirable suppliers to buy from because they're, uh, they, they give them a good price, well, that would be of concern. And I think, and I think it wouldn't be unreasonable for you to ask the question, you know, do you base it on risk assessment and what is that risk assessment? If you're not convinced, then you probably just go and um, maybe see could you assess them yourself. Okay, uh, Bria buys and sells multiple ingredients used for further manufacture of food. Would conducting a risk assessment on product groups versus individual products be against FISMA requirements? Uh, okay. I'll be honest and say I'm not sure, okay, because again, it, it is kind of an emerging kind of area. Um, I mean, leaving aside the FISM requirements, which I'm not sure about, uh, I wouldn't want to give, you know, the advice on that because I'm just, I don't think anybody could say for sure unless they've been through some initial inspections. Maybe some people have, uh, 
have and could say. But you know, I mean, in in theory, it is okay to do it on product categories once the intrinsic and extri extrinsic properties of that material are the of all materials in that group are the same. So you could, you know, technically and scientifically argue that a, gen a generic group assessment of those materials is okay and it's valid. But if there's one or two in there which has a slightly different uh, property or characteristic about it, then I think you may run into trouble there if the author is sharp enough to pick it up. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm just looking through. Okay, Vicky's asking, are manufacturers required to disclose their GFSI audit report? Some of our suppliers are certified and we have asked for their audit report to review, but they say it is confidential and cannot be shared. Do I have a, do I have a leg to stand on if I push back? Oh, okay, it's a good question. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I think you might it would probably depend on the scheme, probably. But... I actually don't know the answer to that. I, it was surprising they wouldn't make the report available. You know, I mean, it, it represents the, the findings of the audit which, and the, against which they're certified. But uh, it's a good question. I actually don't know the answer. I, 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 I would suggest, I mean, who could answer that could be the, uh, the certifying scheme and the yeah. protocol. Yeah. Well, I think now on the BRC, on their database, uh, if you're certified, then your certificate and report is uploaded there. Mm. Uh, and uh, whether that's accessible to customers or whether you have to give privilege to, to share, I don't know. Um, mm. But it's probably different per, per GFSI scheme, like you say, George. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, can you see any more questions, George? <laughs> uh, Just lots of comments and great content and great presentation. Uh, okay. Right. Uh, yeah. Okay, we, we are over the time. Uh, great content, great presentation. And uh, you'll be able to watch this back, look at the chat. Uh, and and uh, look at the presentation itself. So fantastic. So thank you very much, George, for your time today. You're more than welcome. Thanks, Simon. Okay, uh, ladies and gents, that's uh, George Howard, CEO of Safe Food 360. Um, hope you enjoyed that and got something out of it. Uh, some of the questions were very, very specific. I noticed there was one about Okara from Japan. Uh, is it a considered a food in, in the US? And I, I don't think George would, would know very, very specific things like that are related to products. Um, you can always head over to the IFS Grand Forum and put your question on there. Um, so thanks very much. I've put the certificate in the sidebar. Um, hopefully I'll see some of you on the uh, behavior and food safety culture training on Tuesday with Dr. David Rosenblatt. Um, yeah, I'll put the chat logs on the and link to it as well, Matteo. Right, happy Friday, enjoy the weekend, and uh, we'll see you on the next one. Take care, bye.